Yeah, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's, let's get this going. You gonna start? No, I thought you were gonna start. Oh. Aren't you? Aren't you? Didn't you just say you wanted me to? You wanted? Didn't you just say you were gonna start? You wanted me to talk? All right, ready? Here we go. <laughs> ready. <laughs> I'm like looking at you going, what is this jackass doing? <laughs> Good day, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Hazmat Guys. I'm Bobby Salison, so let's get into it. And everybody, welcome back. We are dealing with episode 50. We're going to be getting a little bit deeper into the illustrious uh, laws of our country. And uh, how they affect us and how they uh, don't go to sleep, leave it on, yeah. all right? Because don't forget, we may be doing laws, but we are the premier podcast dealing with hazardous materials response for the fire responder. And we're going to give you the knowledge and insight to do your job safely, effectively, and legally. Yes. I'm, I'm Michael Monaco. I'm glad to be here with Bob Salverson, my co-host. I think we just lost about a dozen people. Right. There. I'm sure we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Mike was saying, we, we are doing laws. Uh, and if you haven't heard my whole shtick on, on why, uh, please go back to episode 49, the one previous to this. Uh, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was very uh, upsetting, to be honest with you. I, I, I came back to Mike and I said, Mike, I know this is a dull topic. And he says, every topic is <laughs> it's a dull topic. <laughs> but, um, I think this is this is one of those nuts that we have to crack. And you know what? The, to be honest with you, we have to crack this thing and open it up and and really kind of feed it to you guys because we've taken uh, the enormity of at least the United States. Our law books are profound. Uh, they're they're offensive. <laughs> I think. Oh, and it's we, insane. Uh, but we spent uh, a good amount of time, and we have condense the nonsense i think down to a very manageable point so we are finishing up the second part of law and uh i think we're going to kind of wrap it up tonight and we're going to do a couple of things maybe uh, very soon yeah definitely I, and i think as boring as a topic as this is it, it really just you know hold it with us we're going to try to do our general formula of 50 percent knowledge 20 percent joking around and 30 percent just fluff yeah um so we'll uh, we'll figure it out. Well, you know what, uh, you know, I I went to this class, so I was kind of uh, telling Mike about that was the format we were going with. I was telling Mike about what I learned, and one of these things that I learned, again, these things are those awareness and operations level things that we keep we we hear about, and inevitably the instructor goes over and he glazes over these things and says, oh. yeah, you might hear about Sarah Title Three, blah blah blah. Right. He doesn't care. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. He's thinking Sarah is that chick at the bar at the end of the night. That's that's as close to Sarah as as he actually knows. I guarantee you that most people have no idea about these laws, and they sit up there and they're like, "Yeah, Sarah, super fun." And they're like, "With Superman?" They're like, "No, super fun." And they're like, I, I, "That's all I know. It's it's on the it's on the PowerPoint. Let's just move on." Right, but I mean, we're trying to just and listen. We're not going deep into this. We're just going to tell you what it is, really lightly. And if you want to go read more, you're more than welcome to go read more. Uh, this one in particular, actually, just about all these things, with the exception of the NFPA, uh, which they charge you an arm and a leg for. Uh, everything's free. Everything you can get online, and uh, I do not recommend it. Be, don't don't print it out for love of Pete. Ooh, not ooh. print them out. They are uh, hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of pages that long. Um, there are condensed the nonsense, like cliff note type things, but this is the most condensed. So if you really want to read uh, the most condensed that I know of, check out the show notes in this and uh, all of our, you know, our, uh, our episodes. But let's get into the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act, known as SARA, Mike. Excellent, excellent. So when, when does SARA start to come into play? Okay, this one really kind of started to come about in like 1980. And this is because of the increasing interests of the federal government and public interest in hazmat. Now, I, you know, I'm not trying to date myself, but I do remember that 
every like really in the middle to early 1980s hazmat in the fire service was the catch man everybody was doing it in the 80s it was it was hazmat in the 90s it was rapid inch of intervention in the 2000s remember this i mean like oh, every decade almost had its own shtick right right in the 80s everybody had a hazmat team like everyone it, it was like the cocaine of that of the yeah. fire world it's so cool <laughs> everybody was doing it <laughs> yeah all the cool kids are doing it but this is because in a nutshell we all right so we had about 10 years since the time we had we talked about the clean water rack uh and circular right um circular was the compensation part of that thing but it took about six years for congress to come about passing standards that would be used in the state and local now remember before this we only dealt with federal level stuff now we're starting to get down to state and local levels of government and rip you know up to this date everything was federal all right so now we're getting a little closer to home so what they really did was they made four different titles and we only really talk about the third title right title three that's the one you usually hear about uh, right but the first one is response and liability the second one's miscellaneous hazardous wastes the third one which is more for us is the emergency planning and community right to know act we've heard this you have a right to know well, this is it. This is how you as the responder, ha as an employee, even if you're a volunteer, you're an employee of your fire department, you are entitled to know what you dealt with, even if you don't, it's an unknown. Right. So, so this breaks down from both community all the way down to that individual workplace. Mm -hmm. Because as a community, we have a right to know what I'm cooking up in my backyard. Exactly. Exactly. And then, yeah. So I, this is actually really important stuff that everybody just glazes over. Exactly. But right, everybody should know if you're any in any kind of industry, you should know what you're dealing with. You should know how to get stuff off of you and how it's going to affect you, and just how to be safer. Sarah, Title Three is so important. And then the last title is Radon Gas and Indoor Quality Research, which. Yeah, it kind of does affect us, but it's mostly for like those uh, basements that have the radon that's naturally occurring through the uh, the the ground. But I, I'm gonna say, I well, I'm I'm gonna say it, and I'm gonna probably shoot myself in the foot for saying it. But I I don't think very many hazmat guys deal with radon responses. This is more of like a chronic <laughs> uh, thing, right? Versus acute, which is kind of what more we're dealing with. That's all we'll have. All right, so so we got we have four four titles that we're dealing with one two three and four there are two in particular that are for us the first responder so right. let's let's focus in a little more on what deals with the people who are listening to the show okay specifically title one section 126 that's what i want you to focus on that's the only part i want you to focus on in title one which says to me that the <laughs> 125 sections before <laughs> garbage to me. It's crap it's nothing oh. But anyway, that mandates that both OSHA and EPA make regulations on safety training and emergency operations on the follow-up after the fact. Okay, so let me explain this to you because I just had a long conversation. I'm in New York State. New York State is not an OSHA state, okay, which means that we kind of have exempted ourselves from certain provisions of OSHA. We'd say, you know what, we're just not dealing with it. We're not doing it. Which is so weird to me weird right osha it's so weird that they could be like yeah i'm out yeah and it's, it's okay and new york i mean like you know unions and all the other crap so the guy's saying we're not an osha state i said i understand that but you have to know that the laws are set up differently and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to quote you two different things 29 cfr 1910 120 that's osha that's what we as hazmat technicians deal under and 40 cfr 311 same exact thing so what this says is that the nation, everybody, I don't care where you're from, what you look like, you, everybody adheres to EPA. So even if you're not OSHA, you're still doing EPA. So, so all right. So here's, here's what I want you guys to do out there. The next time you're in a class, right, and the instructor goes, this falls under 29 CFR 1910-120, and, and you're not in an OSHA state, raise your hand. And be like, you know, we're not an OSHA state. This doesn't matter to us. Why, why are you teaching us? See if he turns around or she 
turns around and goes, yes, that's true, but we also fall under EPA. If he has a deer in headlights look to you, he's reading off the page and knows nothing more. And that's and, and that's where it really comes down. It, there's a lot of redundancies that I found in these CFRs that deal with those. I don't want to say loopholes, but those. Uh, there's an, a great deal of overlap. That if you are able to omit yourself from one section or another, there might be another section or another law in itself that says, "No, no, no, you can't do that no more." So, mm. very interesting. So, so just because you find one spot, you got to really have read everything to be able to get a full picture. That's the all right. So the the second piece of this is the the Title Three. What have you had on that Title Three? Okay, I'm only specifically talking about Title Three, Subtitle A and B. That's it. Okay. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's the required planning and notifications. So now, now the state and local governments have to do two things. First, this one, and now this two, these two um, uh, subtitles, this is what they mandated the state and local governments to do. They re have to reevaluate their need for emergency response planning. So whether, whatever they had, they have to pull it out of the drawer and reevaluate it based on the current standard, which is like 1985, let's say. Does it, does it give a, uh, a time frame for that? Every couple of years, every... I don't think so. I, I I could not find that, but there might be a better law guy out there than I am. Uh, I did not see that. It just said reevaluate, and I'm quoting that one. Um, and it also said reevaluate the needs of the responders for the adequacy of gear, training, and safety. Now, I would say that's probably going to be an ongoing process. I'm yeah, I, imag I imagine this could be a slippery slope here because, you know, if you are kind of a – uh, not very well or motivated, um, say a, a chief or a commissioner or a town planner, and something happens, I imagine th that wording leaves you open for them to go, well, you should have reevaluated it sooner. Exactly. Exactly. So just, yeah. So just, you know, it's, it's a lot harder for you to defend yourself on a word like reevaluate without a time frame then it is going to be for you to say, well, it says reevaluate, and it didn't give me a time frame, and we're reevaluating every 50 years. Right. And but, see, I mean, I a lot of these laws, they don't make them, I, I, I want to say this the right way, they don't make them black and white. They leave some color in it so that you can interpret it from left, right, top, bottom. You know, when you really write these things, uh, you know, tight, black and white, well, then you better live by the letter of the law or else you're, you know, you're, you're committed. But I think this is kind of like they left it gray so they can pinch somebody if they want to and let right. other people slide if they want to. But now listen, this, this gives us a little dancing room. Uh, not us as me and Bob, me and Bob are just, we're peons in right. the, in, no in our system. We're, we're nobodies. But if you're sitting here listening to this show and let's say you run a team uh, and you know you're kind of that mid range mid ma mid manager type of person. This this gives you the teeth to go to your superiors and say we have reevaluated, and as per Sarah Title Three, uh, subsection B, we are not meeting the needs and adequacies of the gear training and safety. Right, and again, so, and on. Yeah, it gives you it gives you legs to stand on. So now you can turn around and you can fight for that gear, and you can you can say that if something goes wrong, you know I, I have put in for this, and now it falls onto your feet to to defend why you didn't hold up your end of the law. Right. All right, and this one also required that OSHA and EPA creates and, and enforces safety and training requirements. Now, I'm just going to go off on this for a second. Remember that there's laws and there's regulations. Now, like, uh, you know, a law is, all right, uh, I'll give you a specific example. The uh, Congress says, I want clean water. So they make regulations and the regulations say, well, we're going to reduce, um, uh, you know, pollutants and we're going to do. So the regulations support the laws. The laws by themselves are the enforceable part. The regulation is the, the, the argument you have to enforce those laws. Okay. So in, in the picture of a table, okay. The law would be the actual table part. The regulations would be the legs. Yeah, I did. Yeah, supporting that's, that law up. 
Yeah, that's a that's a spooky way of saying it. That's a little weird. It is. But okay. It is. We, well, I'm sitting at a table right now, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. All right, that sounds good. Um, Pull that out of something. <laughs> and also because hazmat incidents are handled on a local level, which is really what happens, right? We we don't handle it with federal resources. It can be monitored and even assisted, or taken over by the federal government if needed. Let's say you have the the calamity. If they see that you're not pulling this off, and you see this a lot in the cop movies where the FBI comes in for a, a kidnapping case, well, they can technically do that with hazmat scenes. But if they see that you're making good moves, they're there in assistance. And very rarely, you know, and I'm going to guess probably like more of a rad thing that they'll get involved in. But it's required that all responders be trained to a minimum level of proficiency in the event of an upgrade in response. Now, let me explain that. If you are from Joe Blow Fire Department and you have uh, something that is outside of your realm, what they're saying is that now all of your responders need to be able to integrate with the federal resource if they are so inserted. And now we, we deal with these guys on a fairly regular basis, but you're not talking about like the EPA stepping in. As, as far as I can understand, from around like New York City, we have military teams that are kind of on standby, uh, right? The the um, uh, what do they C call them? The cert the C burn the cert teams, right? Right? Are they cert CB? Yeah, we have military teams that are relatively close by, and they're ready to come in and take over if need be. And I'm sure that's what would end up happening if we had like a super long term event, say like a, a dirty bomb in Manhattan. And there was a lot of cleanup to be going on. I'm sure we would do the first responding, and then they would kind of be the ones to come and take over. And this is what gives them the authority to do that. Right. So it's an interesting thing. All right. So we've got Sarah. We've got Circla. Um, you want to dive a little bit more in the, uh, in the Resources Conf Conservation and Recovery Act? Yeah. Well, this one, um, this one came out in 1976. This is another one. It's called RCRA. You might have heard of this one. And it's a little bit older than the ones we've been doing. I, you would think that we would keep it on uh, on track. Why are we out of order, Mike? Well, because it's our show and we can do whatever the hell we want. I mean, good point. <laughs> let's just throw it out like that. All right. But seriously, is there a reason why this was written that way? Okay. So let's, we're going to. Uh, Bring it back to 1976. This was enacted to combat the ever-increasing amount of solid and municipal waste generated by the population, right? The population is growing, and we are uh, not just, uh, you know, a solid waste as in human, but we're also talking about garbage. We're also talking about uh, refuse. We're talking about, um, you know, cars and, and, and machinery and all this other stuff. And these regulations are going to be found in 40 CFR. 40 CFR is the EPA, parts 239 through 282. Okay. That's the only parts that we're talking about right now. So, so are, are these, the, are these the whole, um, I hear the saying a lot when people are teaching it, they say that the cradle, the grave. Ah, yes. This is, is this, this is it. This is where that whole cradle, the grave thing falls into. Grave. Right. So they saying that the EPA has now the authority to control a chemical, not a company, a chemical, the, the actual, uh, the juice, right. Uh, <laughs> means that they can handle it from the generation transportation, storage, disposal of any hazardous waste. And it's also the framework to regulate even non-hazardous wastes. Okay. Mm. All right. So, and in 1986, they amended this to encompass underground tanks storing hydrocarbons. So this is where the gas tank, you know, you see these uh, gas stations on the corner and they're getting the tanks ripped up. That's because RCRA 1976 says that if you don't meet these specs, you got to rip it up and put in new ones. Which is why everybody has now been ripping it up and putting in new ones. That's exactly it. And, and so and, this is where it is. And this is, uh, uh, this is kind of a big business where we are on Long Island because for a long time, everybody put their oil tanks in the ground because yeah. they didn't want 275 gallons of diesel fuel sitting in their basement. Uh, these metal tanks began leaking and seeping into the ground. And now if you don't get them abandoned, uh, before the EPA comes in and does random testing and you have a leak, you're in for a tremendous amount of fines. Yeah. Actually, I, I defaulted on my uh, – I'm not going to say default. That's the wrong word. I uh, I abandoned my first house 
the one I was going to buy because I put a vacuum test and the guy goes, I don't even think there's a tank under there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's a, it's a colander. Yeah. You have a 500-gallon okay. like colander in the ground. I said, I guess I'm not buying this. All right. <laughs> ah. All right. So we, we talked a lot about federal type stuff. Let's shrink down a little to some stuff that gives states some power. So the, the, the uh, State Emergency Response Commission, the, what is that, S-E-R-C, yes. uh, and the Local Emergency Planning Committee, which is going to be what, L-E-P-C? Correct. All right. Give us some stuff on that. Okay. This is where the federal government told the states, listen, make sure all your people are getting the training that you need and make sure that it's actually happening. Mm. Not that, you're not just signing the paper. Make sure that when it hits the fan, they can actually perform. So, which is kind of a weird thing to say because why do you have to say, I hope it's actually happening? That means you know. Absolutely, you know it's not happening. Absolutely. I don't know about that. But anyway, uh, this is. Believe me, it, it is happening in industry, it is happening in first responders. Anywhere that people can cut corners to save a couple bucks, they are absolutely doing it and uh, i will give credit to to my department where credit is due the one thing they do is training above and beyond but there are a lot of places out there that are severely lacking in the training hence one of the reasons of us doing this show yeah um so what do you want to go into the scrc all right sure so the 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 circular Cir circ S E R C. I guess you can't really say circa. Cir There's no. Yeah, that's weird. All right. So the the circa uh, is the state level regulation. All right. It allows the state to supervise and to figure out how the states and local governments and emergency services will interact in the event of emergency. This kind of it it it, it is going to turn around and force little departments to have to work together, and it forces agencies to have to work together. And if we look at the uh, LEPC, uh, this is even more local regulation. So what do you have on the LEPC, Bob? All right. So the LEPC would in identify and ensure that the following is happening, that we identify the facilities and travel routes in our area. This is like pre-plan, right? This is like the guys in a rig. Uh, we drive around town and we see which way are the trucks coming in and out, what facilities are around. Another thing is to prepare the response procedures for facilities and emergency responders. Again, pre-planning. We go there. We see what's going to happen. What's the probability? Where are they going to run to? We're going to designate community and facility emergency response coordinators. Who's going to be the guys in charge when it happens? Okay. And also, we're going to provide for timely re release of detection and notification procedures. So we're also going to say... Once we get these things, our, P, uh, our, our public information officer, our, uh, we're going to talk to the press. We're going to make sure that the public is, is, is apprised. And we're also going to assist in the development of evacuation plans, training programs, and planned exercises. So we're now, as an emergency service, going to work hand-in-hand -hand with industry to make sure that we are both prepared. They know how we're going to play, and we know how they're going to play. Right. So it, it, it kind of puts... Uh a sense of urgency to pre-planning. Yes. It forces small municipalities and governments and fire departments to turn around and say, listen, you need to get your act together. You can't just blindly respond to something. You have to know what's in your area and be ready to respond to what is generally going through your area. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, and since we're talking about Sarah, you know, back before, I would like to make one more point, even though this could be easily put in the episode on 29 CFR or 40 EPA 311. Again, those things are coming. Uh, actually, yes, coming very soon. <laughs> very soon. Uh, 49 CFR. Now, 49 CFR is the transportation. That's where DOT, that's, that is literally the placarding, labeling, how things are transported across the land. Interstates. Interstates. The well, pretty much anywhere. It's actually when we give you the 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 the, the reason for forty nine CFR, you're going to see it pretty much encompasses everything. 
Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be getting into this because, uh, you know, again, these are important things. Um, I, I can't understate it, but we do have some pretty awesome things coming up. We just got an email today uh, that I'm pretty excited about. You're going to hear about that coming up very soon. What else, Mike? Uh, well, we actually got a, uh, a contact email today from somebody who was reviewing the show who said, uh, hey, wow, really loved episode 49. Um, you guys are doing a good job of explaining the laws and making it interesting. So he's either uh, lying to us <laughs> completely or maybe we actually have figured out a way to talk about the laws without killing people. Uh, yeah. Or he's a lawyer and this is actually fun for him. <laughs> Like, could you imagine that? Could you imagine if the, the lawyers are like, wow, this is incredible. And the regular people are like, holy crap, I want to shoot myself. The worst. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that pretty much wraps up another episode of the Hazmat, guys. Everybody that's out there listening, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to listen to us. And hopefully we made your job just a little bit easier. Yeah, and you can go and find us on Facebook and Twitter at The Hazmat Guys. And please take a moment to go to iTunes and put in a review of our podcast, or you can call our new common hotline at 843-628-1484. If you call that number and you leave us a message, you're going to get on the air. Because I, I know how hard it is to get a, a review on iTunes. It's, an, it's like an act of Congress to get something written up there. It's insane. It's insane. Now, I know that I have a beautiful voice. I know Bob has a beautiful voice. What? And if, if, you, if you can only imagine that our faces match our voices and you want to see that, we record a live show, all right? We produce the live show, and it is unedited, and it goes out on YouTube every week. So you can literally watch us make fools of ourselves every single week. Uh, if you want to get information on when we're going to be doing the show and, and be ready, you can find out more information, Google Plus us, and uh, follow us on Google Plus. You'll be notified when the show starts, and we should probably start giving people an idea of when we're going to do it a little bit in advance. Not that anybody wants to watch us and listen to us, but right. in case you do, there it is. Ta-da. Well, <laughs> we're always looking forward to your feedback or information about interesting incidents that you've had or a part of. So send us a note at feedback at the hazmat guys.com. Remember everybody, don't just get on the job, get into the job. Now, remember everybody. Now the show is officially closed and we are going to basically just reboot. So stand by if you're interested in a, another link that I'm going to put out on Facebook and all the other places that we're going to do 49 CFR riveting stuff. Um, this is the transportation one and I'm hoping it works out well. So if you guys are interested, I see all 27 of you, uh, come we on. We have 27 people watching. Uh, whatever. My eyes are blurry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it could be two or maybe seven. I don't know. <laughs> wow. So that's pretty cool. Come on back. We're going to stop the broadcast and reboot. We really appreciate you coming back. We'll see you soon.